Good evening. I'm Tamika Hollis, a member of the Baltimore Museum of Industry's Board of Trustees. I am delighted to welcome you all of you to this evening's program on The Afro, Baltimore's Black Media Authority, past and present. For those not familiar with the Baltimore Museum of Industry, we are located on the waterfront just south of Baltimore's Inner Harbor. We are dedicated to telling the stories of the workers and entrepreneurs who built Baltimore into a manufacturing powerhouse. Our print shop gallery examines Baltimore's journalism and printing industries. And we are working with the staff of the APRO to make sure that remarkable publication stories is well represented in this gallery. Programs like this are made possible thanks to the generous support of our members and donors. If you are a current supporter, thank you. If you'd like to find out more about becoming a member, I encourage you to visit our website, thebmi.org. Your support will ensure that we can continue to engage people in important conversations like the, this one we're looking forward to tonight. Tonight's program is an example of how two unique museums in Baltimore can up our games and bring you even better programs by working together. We are pleased to partner with the Lily Carol Jackson Civil Rights Museum to host this discussion. Now, I'd like to hand the floor over to Alexis Ozer Brown, who works as the marketing coordinator at the BMI, as well as the program and education coordinator at the Lily Carol Jackson Museum. Thank you, Alexis. Good evening, everyone. I am Alexis Ojeda Brown. I am the marketing coordinator for the Baltimore Museum of Industry and the program and education coordinator for the Lily Carol Jackson Civil Rights Museum, which is an off campus site, a part of Morgan State University's Office of Museums. We honor the legacy of Mrs. Lily Carol Jackson, known as the mother of the civil rights movement. And we celebrate the contributions of the Jackson Mitchell family, the Carey family, and countless others who fought for the adva advancements of civil rights in Maryland. Baltimore's role in civil rights movement is sometimes overlooked, but there is no denying how this city made an impact reaching far beyond the Eastern shore and the Afro-American newspaper is a prime example of this. I now pass the spotlight on to Frances Draper, a Morgan State University alumna and publisher of the Afro-American newspapers. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. What a privilege it is um, for us to be with you tonight. Thank you to the Baltimore Museum of Industry. Thank you to the Lily um, Carol Jackson Museum of Civil Rights. And for all who are watching tonight, I'm sure somebody tonight will encourage you to like this broadcast, to share it, um, because I'm, I'm looking forward to all the information. So as, um, Alexis said, I am the publisher, CEO and publisher of the 128 year old Afro-American newspapers, which was founded by my great grandfather in 1892, almost 129 years ago. And so I'm pleased to be here with some of the members of our team on tonight. Um, the Reverend Dorothy Bulware, who is our managing editor, uh, Misha Green, who is our Washington, Washington editor and our social media, editor as well as Jessica Dorch, who is our news editor. Yes, we have three um, women in those positions and we are so glad to be here on tonight. So thank you again. All right, we will now introduce our panelists and we will start with Misha Green. Hello, everyone. Again, I am Misha Green. I am DC and digital content editor. I am really excited to speak with you all today about the power of the Black press and particularly what we're doing at the Afro. Uh, what we've been doing over the past 129, almost 130 years next year. Um, but also, as we have found the need like everyone else to pivot during the pandemic and really create content that's important to all communities and specifically tells the story of the black community. And so I'm really excited uh, to share some of the work that we've been doing today for having us. All right, I will now hand the floor to Jessica Dorch. 
Hi, everyone. Yes, my name is Jessica Dorch, and I am the news editor for the Afro. And I'm so thankful to be a part of this discussion. And I'm very excited to be here. All right, now I'll pass it to Lisa Mitchell. Good evening, uh, Lisa Mitchell Sonar, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm a descendant. My uh, great grandmother was Lily Carol Jackson, and I'm one of the family uh, volunteer advisors that helped work with Morgan State University in terms of uh, getting the museum reopened. I also have the honor uh, to write a monthly column with the Afro-American newspaper uh, in the tradition and the, the column is entitled From the Jackson Mitchell Files, more about our fight for freedom. And thank you to the Afro, thank you Reverend Draper, thank you to the Baltimore Museum of Industry for helping us to celebrate and actually teach our history. You know, what uh, this um, magnificent community, what our ancestors uh, did, we can learn from. And the Afro is a beacon uh, in this uh, reality that we're going through now to celebrate the best and the brightest that our community has offered and continues to offer. Thank you. Last but certainly not least, I will pass it over to Reverend Dorothy Bolwar. Good evening, um, I am Dorothy Bolwar. I'm the managing editor of The Afro. I started as a reporter there, a general assignment reporter, and I uh, worked up through the ranks. I have retired and returned a number of times. I just can't stay away from The Afro. And so thank you so much for this invitation and for this opportunity to talk about um, one of our favorite things. Thank you, everyone. So we are really excited about putting this program together, talking about diversity. Important, but it's definitely been at the forefront uh, given the state of our nation. So we're gonna ask, start asking a couple of questions about our panelists, the history of the Afro and how it relates to diversity in media and its shape on public opinion. So for our first question, and again, anyone can go ahead and take the stand for these questions. What makes the Afro unique compared to other news sources? I would definitely say um, our perspective you know, I think it's one of a kind, surely. And um, just to give you a quick example, um, last year around this time when COVID, you know, first hit the country and, you know, we were going through the bouts and the headlines of COVID, it was just everywhere. Um, we actually printed a story on our front page about the locust outbreak in Africa. You know, so it's like these stories that aren't, aren't told, you know, they're not making the headlines, but they're still happening and it's still news and it's relevant, you know, for, for black people, for all people really. Would anyone else like to answer that question? So, well, I can, I'll just add and say, uh, also I think the wealth of archival uh, information that we have at the Afro truly makes a difference in terms of the kind of reporting that we're able to do now. Um, and us being very rooted in the fact that we come from such, such a strong history and it being part of our daily work at the Afro, knowing that history. Uh, and I think that's, that's very, very key. I've worked for other organizations, but to uh, know that this publication has a longstanding history of informing African-Americans at a time where certain, where much of our community couldn't even read when we were founded in 1892. Um, and, and many of our ancestors, it was a crime to do so uh, and to be able to have that level of education and that level of, of pushing knowledge um, to our community. And so in that sense, I think it comes with a strong sense of pride and, and really, again, makes us unique um, in comparison to other, even other African-American publications is our long, long history that we're still very connected to. Thank you. And you kind of touched on it with some of your uh, answers, but because it has such a long history, are, what are some of the biggest uh, challenges that the newspaper have faced? 
I think one of the challenges has been um, just purely access because because we are black paper, we write black news um, for and about black people. One of the early challenges was that um, even though we were media, we were subjected to the same racism and the same um, lack of access that everybody, every other um, paper of minority was subjected to. So um, we had to clamor even to get the news and to be, um, um, Sam Lacey used to tell a story when he was covering Jackie Robinson of how he would go to the games when they first started and they would make him sit on top of the press box rather than sit in the press box with the other reporters. And he tells a story about this one particular time when he took his seat and all the white reporters got up and they went and sat with him um, rather than leave him up there by himself. But it's the kind of thing that um, Afro writers have had to endure throughout. So that, that's one of the things is the lack of access. And another challenge, which is sort of a happy thing that also a hard challenge is um, we don't have the ability to hold on to our best talent because once they um, get some notoriety and, and other organizations see them, they get hired away from them. So we have had to accept our role in the community as a training ground for journalists and not one that could necessarily hold on to them. And I just I was want to also, oh, I'm oh, no. sorry, go ahead, Misha. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, um, and I we did a little bit in the back in our introductions, but my background is broadcast journalism. And so I was really excited when I came onto the Afro uh, that our leadership was really uh, open and wanted to expand our coverage not solely to the newspaper and online platform, but really heighten our broadcast digital uh, coverage. And it has been great in terms of my excitement in that background and being able to give that and offer some of, of the things that I, that I know and do with the Afro. However, because people see us as the Afro newspaper and what we've been branded as for you know over a century, it is very hard to start getting some of these people who have known us for years to pivot and know that we're doing broadcast packages and live shows. And we've had a lot of great uh, content digitally uh, over the pandemic and even before, but that has some of that has come from us saying, hey, look, we can do this. Uh, but it, that's sometimes a, an upward battle of getting people to know we're not just the newspaper, we are the Black media authority. And so in that, we have the ability to cover all sorts of news in all sorts of places with all kinds of coverage ways. And, and broadcast and digital is one of the ways we've really been able to thrive and grow in the past year and a half. And I just wanted to piggyback um, real quick off of uh, Rev what you said about um, just the Afro being a training ground. I mean, it's so true. I was an intern at the Afro back in like 2012. Um, my dad, I just found out he was a paper boy. He used to deliver the Afro in Cherry Hill. You know, he has this um, like this news clipping of him um, featured somewhere and he has it in his house. I mean, so I, I went there and I'm like, looking. I'm like, wait a minute, this is the Afro. So, you know, it's like in it's, the Afro is such a pillar in our community you know it it's not a bad thing that it you know we're a training ground you know I mean I think that's such a compliment because literally you can ask anybody in Baltimore you know just drop yourself in the center of the city and say hey do you know the afro and they're gonna say oh yeah you know and have many stories to tell so you know that's not a bad thing at all you know I just wanted to say my uh, grandfather um, Clarence Mitchell Jr.'s first job uh, after graduating from Lincoln University during the Depression, was as an Afro reporter. And um, it just, the first, um, one of the first stories he covered was the lynching of George Armwood on the Eastern Shore. And can you imagine, I mean, coming from that experience, it shaped him. It, 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 it arced the rest of his life in terms of a commitment uh, to civil and human rights. And that's largely in part of the experiences he got with the Afro 
under the tutelage of uh, legendary uh, Dr. Carl Murphy, who in and of himself is just a legend uh, in terms of, of the Afro, not just in terms of the Afro, but in terms of the media and leadership landscape across the country and across the world. But he got that experience as a 23 year old uh, reporter with the Afro-American newspaper and um, it changed his life. Thank you for bringing up uh, Clarence Mitchell's role with the Afro-American newspaper. We definitely cover the lynching of George Armwood in our museum. And that's something that we highlight how it definitely spurred him on his uh, road for civil rights, specifically in Baltimore, but eventually impacting the entire nation, often referred to as the 101st Senator for a lot of his uh, work that he'd done. Just a note too that, I mean, Dr. Murphy, what, uh, Carl Murphy was uh, on the national board of the NAACP. So when we talk about activist journalism, leadership, uh, in journalism, uh, and his uh, granddaughter uh, definitely uh, is in that uh, same vein in terms of helping to shape our community. That's what our great uh, media outlets do. That's what the Afro has always done. It's been a beacon. It hasn't waited to find out what the community should do. It looks at the community, it's a part of the community, and has always uh, taken a leadership role in terms of stepping forward uh, for Black Baltimore and for the country. Thank you. I will pause to say for everyone watching, uh, if you want to drop comments in our Facebook Live, we will pick some questions from the audience uh, towards the end after our official uh, questions have been asked. So I just wanted to put that out there. But for our next question, and we've kind of, you know, been covering over this with everyone's brilliant answers. What are some of the Afro's contributions to Baltimore civil rights history and America's civil rights history as a whole? And I know there's tons, so go ahead, just let loose. <laughs> you know, the Afro is the paper of record. Um, when it comes to African-American history, when it comes to the civil rights movement, just the other day, someone sent me um, an incorrect item that had been um, printed in another newspaper. And uh, they, the Afro had the story correct, the date correct, and verified that Morgan students were indeed among the first to do the sit-ins back in 1955, although somebody else had been um, credited with being the first at a, at a later date. So the Afro has been right there to tell the story, to take the pictures, and to participate. When, when I first read that question, my thought was, not a what, but a who. And that who is Moses Newson. Moses Newson was um, editor in chief of the Afro for many years, but as a writer, he actually traveled with the Freedom Riders um, in the South and was nearly killed um, on one of those journeys. But he was right there to write the story and, and get it back to the Afro. So people in Baltimore knew what was going on. When we look at the, I'm sorry, you go ahead, Reverend Jane. No, I was, say, I was just going to add, um, Sarah Loans just did a series called Who Deserves a Monument? This is a product of, that's in the Baltimore City Public School. She just completed it. Episode five is on just what, Alexis, just what you asked about the Afro and the civil rights history. And she thought she was going to just talk about John Murphy. Of course, she ended up talking about uh, Carl Murphy and she ended up talking about the NAACP and all of that but talked about how the Black church and the Black press and the NAACP worked together in Baltimore to get things done long before the dates that we would classify as civil rights. Um, for example, when they were trying to get something called the Poe um, Law defeated, which was going to be a voter suppression, the um, African-Americans who were working in people's homes in the county, just didn't go to work. If, if the person they worked for wasn't in support of defeating that legislation, they just didn't go. And that was organized because the Afro put the call out, the preachers came, the NAACP came. And the other example that's in that podcast is around Board, um, Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. And the Afro was so instrumental in that under Carl Murphy's leadership that the Spingarn Medal that very next year, 1955, went to Carl Murphy for the crusading. So we worked together. It's not that the Afro did it by ourselves. Hmm. Because I'm having trouble hearing you. 
you know, this, um, my phone, Siri likes to talk to me any time of day or night. I didn't even think that um, I was such at her, but in, <laughs> anyway, uh, so we, we think sometimes, you know, we talk about what the Afro's role is, but I just wanted to point, it was in um, community, in cooperation with other people and other organizations. Afro never was a lone ranger. It was a convener. The, Carl Murphy used the Afro to be a convener of community for the good of community, not just to have a paper, but to, to move the needle for civil rights and for a better life for everybody in the community, uh, especially black and brown people. So that, that really, I think that's that whole civil rights history that we have. Um, and, and even today we still work together with other organizations, but that's what I think our main focus was. I just wanted to add that the Afro and how we've been able to report again, which goes back to the question of how we've been unique, is that we were covering things in part pieces of the civil rights movement no one else was doing. A perfect example of that, one of my heroes, Gloria Richardson, uh, who if, you, if those tuning in are not familiar with her, one, go check out the article I just wrote on her last month on afro.com, uh, featured in our We're Still Here edition um, on community activists. But Gloria Richardson was instrumental in a major way to the civil rights movement that was happening uh, on the Eastern shore of Maryland. But in particular, she, she's from, she was from Baltimore. She was always commuting back and forth between the Eastern shore of Baltimore and to DC and she was such an amazing leader that uh, she inspired Kathleen Cleaver uh, in the civil rights move, I mean, excuse me, in the Black Panther movement and talked to Robert Kennedy when no one else was able to talk to him in the very early uh, years of the civil rights movement of the early 60s. Uh, and then she was out of it by 1965 and had moved to New York. That said, when I did the interview on Gloria Richardson, she, uh, by this um, um, guy who it, it has studied her for, I think, over like the past 30 years and knows her and her family, he said, well, I'm really surprised you're coming to me because all the info that I got for her on my book came from the Afro. <laughs> and not only was Gloria Richardson uh, all throughout the Afro during the 1960s, but her family, the Dandridges, I believe, were super famous in Baltimore um, and the Eastern Shore. And we had been covering them pretty much since the beginning of the Afro. And I was able to dig deep into the archives and learn about her family um, in, in such a way that helped me understand why she was the activist who she became and how she was able to inspire uh, the next generation of civil rights leaders and Black Panther leaders. Um, and I just, I think that's super cool. Uh, the fact that not only, um, you know, again, were we there and covering it, but we were covering pieces of the civil rights movement in a way that no one else got and understood. Um, and I think that's really, really important to the Afro's history and American history. Thank you. We're going to kind of switch it up with our questions. We've been talking about the Afro as a whole, but now I would like for, to give you guys a chance as panelists, as individual journalists to answer these questions. Um, so does your cultural or racial identity play a role in how you go about your work? Um, or is objectivity best practice when it comes to being a journalist? Can I just say, I, I don't, oh, go ahead, Reverend. Always go ahead. Best objectivity is always best practice, um, but we are who we are. And it, to me, it's totally impossible to separate yourself from your story because the stories we write are our stories too. Just wanted to say too, uh, my background was in television journalism first. I worked at a local news station in New York, uh, also another uh, news station in Washington, DC and very diverse cities, but not very diverse newsrooms. 
and the journalism did not reflect the communities at all. And I went in kind of as an experiment to just see who are the people who are covering our community and why doesn't the news look like the cities that I live in? And it, it's very clear. So there is no such thing as objectivity. You wanna try to be fair. You wanna try to get the perspective so you can actually get at what actually happened, but you wanna look at, at news through a prism as a human being. And for um, our entire <laughs> reality here in America, we've not been seen as human beings. And that's been a, a major thing. So when we're covering ourselves, we cover us as human beings. And many times some of the non-minority media seem to think that because we see ourselves as human beings, somehow that's not objective and nothing could be further from the truth. That's good. And if I could just piggyback um, off of that, you know, Ms. Draper said, Ms. Draper and I have very long conversations <laughs> almost every day. <laughs> but one of the things that she said to me, um, you know, and, and I'll always remember it, um, we were we were doing something for the paper. We were, you know, we were putting the paper together and everything like that. That's what we do on Wednesdays. It's our deadline day. Um, but, you know, I think it was a headline or something that I was like, Ms. Draper, I don't know. Can we say this? Is this okay? You know, is it too black? Is it too this and Ms. Draper was like, you know, white people are unapologetic, you know, Latinos are unapologetic, Asians are unapologetic, so why can't we be unapologetically black, you know? And and I was like, you're right. If anybody, you know, gets to say black stuff, gets to report on black news, gets to talk about the black life, you know, black lives and um, the black perspective, then it should be the Afro, you know, that's just who we are. Just, you know, like Miss Lisa was saying, that's that's who we are, you know, and that's how that's how we report, you know, because these stories are our stories. We live in the city that, you know, we're talking about and, and, and the stories that we're covering. We're right here in the community, you know, when when um that that yellow tape goes up, you know, that's that's happening in our neighborhoods, unfortunately, but you know, it's still happening. So yeah, I just wanted to say that. And I think that um, all Lisa, Reverend Boulware and mm -hmm. Jessica mentioned it in a sense, but I've, one um, piece for me is that because while, while I try to be truly objective, I'm, you, you know, I, I really try to be a purist, but because I know my experience and the experience of my community. I have to come at it from a place at least of that understanding and that knowledge. Um, and, and so of course there's a level of objectivity, but I think it's almost like I'm able to see pieces of the story in, in, a, in, a, in certain ways that one could not as an African-American woman. Um, and that that includes like, you know, I, Reverend Bullier had to stop me when I was headed to, <laughs> to the Capitol on January 6th, I believe, um, you know, because it, that level uh, that I was going to come with objectivity, uh, I thought, right, and, and it's also going to be there as a Black woman who knows that I'm, I, I, my life is at risk uh, and that who I am is not going to be appreciated there. Um, and if I'm trying to interview somebody with that objectivity, you know, I could have been put in a really dangerous place. Um, and so I think that, uh, you, you know, there's a balance for sure, but the objectivity, I think it always remains, but you have to know who you are and, and, and um, you know, where you're coming from when going approaching any story. Thank you. So in recent years, various newspaper companies have apologized for their publication's past role in bias reporting, which sometimes led to promoting stereotypes or even encouraged acts of violence against black communities. For example, in December, 2020, the Kansas City Star released an article titled The Truth in Black and White, an apology from the Kansas City Star, where they acknowledge for 140 years, their publication has been one of the most influential forces of shaping Kansas City in the region. Um, and for decades, that influence was misused by promoting Jim Crow laws, redlining, prioritizing negative coverage against the Black community, which not only deprived their audience the opportunity to understand the contributions of Black citizens in Kansas City, but also robbed an entire community of opportunity, dignity, justice, and recognition for years. Have you seen changes in how non-Black publications report on issues affecting Black communities? An example could be the coverage of George Floyd protests that happened across the nation last summer, uh, coverage of COVID-19 and its effects on various communities of color. What do you think 
media outlets can do better when it comes to coverage of non-white communities? So it's a lot in that question. So if you need me to repeat it as you guys go on, go ahead and just let me know. You absolutely had a lot, <laughs> a lot in that question. I think there has been some change, but not enough. And I'll tell you where it's obvious. If you look at the newsrooms across the country and look at the percentage of African-American journalists who are in those newsrooms, then you know that even when certain papers repent, if you will, or say that they're doing a different kind of coverage, if you don't have people that look like us in your newsroom, you're, you are subject to write this from the same kind of perspective. And you asked the question earlier, yes, we're unashamedly black. That doesn't mean that we don't try to balance a story. We do try to balance the story, but we have a different viewpoint, a different lens. And we're not monolithic either, by the way, but we do have a different lens by which we judge the stories. And so there's a, a big cry across, across America in newsrooms that um, where the black journalists are saying, hey, you know what? We're not seeing much progress and we're not being promoted and we're not the senior editors. And so um, that is still very much going on. And until that changes, you will not see that kind of change. I'm not promoting it necessarily. I, I mean, I think that the black press has a unique role to play. However, I am promoting it from the standpoint that some of our non-African American publications um, see things through a very, very narrow lens. And so you'll find that black and poor goes together almost all the time when they're talking about the African-American community. And we have um, blacks who are poor, but there are also whites who are poor too. And so the way that we are portrayed in some of the other media is not a true portrayal of our community. And if you just read certain publications across the country, you would think that all of us are of uh, are one way. Um, and don't that you know we don't get married, we don't have children, we don't go to we don't go to school, we don't go to work, you know, we don't do any of those things. We we the things that we do that are negatively um, that are that that are negative in our community, that's what tends to get reported. And every now and then you may see a different kind of story, but it's almost written as if it is an exception and not the rule. So yes, we have our challenges in the community, but our community is so varied. There's so many different things. On the other hand, we at the Afro and other black newspapers, we can fill up 40 pages with nothing but our news. We, we don't have to be balanced in that way and to have everybody's news in the paper. So that's what makes us unique. It's Something interesting. Oh. oh, no, go ahead. Go please, ahead. Please Lisa. continue, please. No, I was going to say this question was really in, is interesting to me because I think about when I was in grad school, which wasn't very long ago. I graduated. Oh, gosh, saying it sounds longer. I graduated in 2016 um, from University of Maryland, College Park. Um, and the entire time I was in their uh, broadcast journalism program, even taking print courses, they were really very, very emphatic on how to report uh, all people, but particularly in order to not shape negative narratives about people of color because that was something that happened so often in media. I also had diverse professors, which helped in ensuring that that was emphasized, um, but it was a really big piece to the point that we generally did not share, you know, in practice articles and and practice press conferences and things like that. If police said the person was black, we would get in trouble if we wrote it in the article, you know, things of that nature, because did that make it important to the story? Or was, or did that, was that fact somehow shaping this story in a different way that, that would, you know, make, make the story change? Um, and it, it was really interesting because we were, in that process, and while I was in grad school, was when the um, Charleston Nine were killed, and uh, it, they were very specific about pointing out that Dylan Roof was a white man, 
um, and how that shaped the story different. We ne you know, never said an all black church, right? In most, of, in most of those things, but that he was a white man. And so I was really hopeful uh, coming out of grad school in terms of where we were in media and how, how people in, of color and all people were shaped. Um, and I'm not seeing, as Dr. Draper said, uh, enough of a change now that we have this knowledge, now that everyone's woke, right? Now, we, I'm confident, though I was in, at University of Maryland on the liberal East Coast, right? But there are enough people in that program that are all over the, all over the United States in these newsrooms, right? And however, we're still getting the, the rhetoric that helps shape the Black community into killers, rapists, um, and looters. Uh, you know, when we when we saw an example of that during the protests, well, suddenly the Black community was looters when actually they were peaceful protesters. Um, and so there's still so much work we have to do in that arena. However, I will say that I have a little hope because only five years ago, I was in a program that said that we, we would get in trouble if we improper, improperly used race, et cetera, uh, as a way of framing a story because they did not want um, that to be an issue to this day. And just to piggyback off of what you were saying, Misha, it is really all about the language. You know, I cannot tell you how many times I have read something off of the Associated Press, the New York Times, you know, the Washington Post, what have you. And I, I'm reading and I'm like, oh, I know a white person wrote this or, or I know they weren't black. You know, the, the author of this piece was not black just because, you know, text has tone. And I don't think that you know, we realize that or or act like we know that as much as we should. But, you know, I'm reading this as a double minority, you know, as a, as an African-American woman, you know. So when you're covering the George Floyd protests and, you know, you're calling people looters and, you know, you're saying, oh, well, you know, he, he stole a counterfeit $20 bill, you know, saying that that's more important to the story or that that somehow makes some type of difference. You know, it's, it's just really... It's, it's, it really just gives me an icky feeling. It's very disgusting, but you know, I think that's something that, um, that, that needs to be brought to the forefront, you know, that, that it's, it's, it's just really a touchy topic, but yes, it's everything that Misha is saying, but I just really wanted to emphasize that language is everything, you know, because I can't read these things in your voice if I don't know you, you know, I'm reading in my voice and, and from my perspective and from my world. And like I said, as a double minority woman, I'm looking and I'm like, well, what does this have to do with anything, you know, but yet to you, that's a major part of the story or that's even your angle sometimes. So, you know, I think that, you know, when, when these, um, larger publications, um, you know, non-white publications, not, yeah, non-black publications are covering, um, you know, black stuff or, you know, anything that has to do with minorities or people of color. I mean, they just really have to watch their language because one word can be so offensive and, you know, one word can be that turning point that's like, wait, what are they trying to say, you know, and that's been getting a lot of people in trouble in recent years and, you know, it's still happening today. I just want to say when you're when you're talking about that in terms of um, just like movements, uh, civil rights movement, human rights movements, it starts locally. The most powerful ones really start locally. So we'll, I think when we look at local journalism, when we look at local, in particular uh, television media, it's important to look at them because whether you are black or not black, you don't always determine who what stories you're covering um, and that kind of thing. And and I think a number of local journalists that I see even here in Baltimore, don't know the city. Do not know the city that they're reporting on. I can tell because they'll go to certain spots that are so fringe, that are so on the margin and not go to main uh, areas in Baltimore. So when they come, they should have to take a tour of the city. They should know, again, like you said, the city that they're reporting on because you, you uh, my kids, teenagers, uh, rarely watch the local news because they'll say, I, I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know what city they're talking about. And, you know, I'll just read the AFO or I'll go, you know, on a blog or somewhere to kind of see what's going on. Because I find even some of the Black reporters from time to time will do stories and it'll make me want to throw something at the television set because they're not reporting in a way that's fair or that that's fair. That's the best way to put it. The interesting thing is, um, even though 
um, major newspapers are settled into the cities. You know, sometimes they'll put a picture of a prominent um, city resident in with the wrong name. And the fact that with larger staffs, many um, copy editors and proofreaders, there's not enough diversity in the newsroom for somebody to catch that error. And that's just a simple sign right there, not being a part of the community that they write about. I'm glad that you guys brought up the importance of being uh, ingrained in the community and knowing the community. Um, while I am a museum professional, I'm no journalist. It, the same thing applies for me. I'm a PG County native, so I was not familiar with the city of Baltimore at all uh, coming out of college. And I landed two jobs at two museums talking about not only the civil rights history of Baltimore, but industry in Baltimore. So instead of, you know, just getting my tour script and just reading what they gave me off the paper, I really wanted to make sure that I did the history justice, that I did the people of Baltimore justice by going out and doing my own research, learning the city myself. Um, and I think that's important for people of multiple industries, multiple professions to do when you're covering um, such important history and such important topics that impact how people view a certain community. So thank you for that. Um, we will go ahead and take a question from the audience really quick. And hopefully I'm pronouncing your name properly, but this is from Holly Burnham. And they wrote, can you describe the connection between the Afro and the Freedom's Journal of the early 1800s? And even to, the Benjamin, ba even to Benjamin Banneker, whose almanacs were published in Baltimore in the 1790s. Do you think it's fair to say that the that Banneker played a role in the success of the African American newspapers? And if you want me to repeat that, <laughs> you can. <laughs> so I'll try to answer some of some of that. Um, listen, let me say I came on this panel to bring greetings, not to really be a panelist, but I'll try to um, <laughs> to, to answer that one. And so. Uh, in 1820, John Rustworm and Samuel Cornish started Freedom's Journal and their first editorial said this, or, and I'm paraphrasing, we wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. And so in terms of that being their mantra in their founding, certainly that has an influence on the Afro and every other black newspaper that followed um, Freedom's Journal. We, we uh, believe the same thing. We wish to plead our own cause as African-Americans. Too long others have spoken for us. We can speak for um, ourselves. And so anyone who pioneered early journalism like they did, and you asked about Benjamin Banneker, I think as well, the early, we stand on their shoulders. We don't reinvent the wheel like that. I mean, we stand on the history and the shoulders of those who came before us. There were three or four black newspapers in Baltimore before the Afro was founded and none of them survived. And so my great grandfather who started the Afro, he was a whitewasher by trade because his father was a whitewasher. And then um, wallpaper came into being and put whitewashers out of business. He was also a printer. He also served in the Civil War uh, as in the colored troops, if you will, as a sergeant in the Civil War. And so there were two or three other black papers before the Afro. And in fact, the Afro itself, when you know, he, there were other people who were there at the beginning, their ventures didn't work well. The name was already there, so it went up on auction. All of that to say, we build on what, we have built on what somebody else already started. And so great impact, I think. Um, and I think it's a mistake too often, you know, we, we reinvent the wheel and don't look back and say, okay, you know what, let's give credit where credit is due. That was really bold of Russ Worm and Cornish in 1820 to have the gall, if you will, to start a newspaper when those who count such things say that less than 3% of the black population could read. So they say, they don't know how many of us could really read. They mm -hmm. count the ones that they knew because it wasn't always safe to tell them that we could. Thank you for that. All right, for our next question. The Afro once served readers across the country with 13 different editions. Where are most of your readers located now? 
Our readers are all over the world. <laughs> they, I mean, we cover Baltimore, we cover Washington, D.C., but we actually, you know, write news about whatever's going on in the Black community. And we have followers on Facebook and, you know, all those places, and they, and they read our news, whether it's online or whether it's sent out in a newsletter or whatever. But, yeah, our readers are all over the world. And not only do they just read our news, Rev, but they also, you know, comment and respond and they DM us all the time on Facebook and they send us pictures and, you know, they send us correspondence and poems and, you know, other other really beautiful things. And, you know, of course we publish it um, and, and, and it's just that connection, you know, we send them back the link and they're like, wow, like, you know, this is the Afro, like, if any, you know, they feel accepted, you know, they feel a, a strong sense of acceptance. And that's what we're all about. You know, we are very inclusive. Yeah, I, I'll just add uh, on the digital side of things, some of our biggest fans are in Nigeria. And we had someone tune in la uh, last week to one of our shows from, I believe it was India. Um, but and, and, and everyone always chimes in and says where they're tuning in from. Um, but truly, we have an international following. And again, I think that's really cool to know that uh, people all over the world are interested in the community that the communities that we're covering here. Um, and it also helps us because because we get that dialogue that Jessica talked about and that engagement uh, so much, it helps us know some of the things to focus on. So for example, because we have a large West African following it, still living in West Africa, let's be clear, it it, it, it's only right that we cover things happening there and how it affects us. Um, in, in terms of COVID-19, we uh, were able to see that people were specifically tuning in to see how the, the Afro was reacting and the people that we were covering all over the world because everyone's affected, but no one's talking about it, how it's affecting the Black community. Um, and we saw it in a big, big way for the protests uh, that were happening. Uh, surrounding George Floyd uh, it, uh, and everything that sort of snowballed after that. Um, again, people were tuning in all over the world and waiting for us to go live and waiting for our reports and saying that, thank you so much because we're in Jerusalem right now or, where, or wherever and not getting that uh, kind of access. And I, and I think part of the reason that we have people from all over goes back to our unique style of coverage. It's just news that people aren't gonna get anywhere else. Thank you. So in this era of fake news and rampant disinformation, how do you encourage media literacy? I just wanna say, when we talk about fake news, um, we've always had fake news. When you look at how the black community has been reported on forever, since we came, we were brought to this country, it has been fake news. And so um, as readers, um, as consumers of news, we have to be interactive. And because of the various platforms that now exist, we can comment, we can interact, we can uh, almost get rid of uh, media if they're not accurate and we can weigh in. I think in ways that we couldn't before. And so we have um, subject matter experts in our community that cover everything. And so it's really up to us to be um, active consumers of media. And I think that's how we counter this so-called fake news that that's the new name for it, but that's how we've kind of, our community has been covered um, historically has been inaccurately. So we can say inaccurate, we can say fake news, And we just continue to tell the stories. The, the, the more we put the stories out there, the more people are willing to read and anxious to read. Um, we don't just write about what's happening in other states and other countries. We write about the man down the street who you know, has done some things to help his neighbor while the neighbor's been sick. 
We write about the college student who's been, you know, going to grad school or the high school student who's been accepted into 10 different colleges. So we tell the stories that people want to know about. And so because we have that relationship with them, then they come back and they read the news and they trust the news that we write. Thank you. So we've talked about the strong community roots the Afro-American newspapers have. We've talked about its global reach and we've talked about how it's expanding beyond print media. I wanted to ask, what does the future hold for the Afro? Where's I'm like Pulitzer Prizes, you know. I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, that I, I think uh, you know, claim it all, right? Let Let's say that the the future for the Afro um, is exactly where where I think we all envision us is greatness. It's where we've been, and it's where we're going to continue going. Um, but I think in in, in terms of small goals uh it's good it's going to be ultimate growth giving more people an opportunity in the community to add their voices to our publication um we that's been our tradition and we've had a bit of a disconnect because we're not on the streets at this moment um and so it it's gonna it, it's really going back to our roots of community reporters and community reporting. And that's in the digital world uh, and broadcast world, as well as in our legacy edition. Um, so so that's that's what I see. The long, long view vision, oh God, we don't have the time for that. <laughs> but I do think that, that the Afro has a lot of amazing things coming up um, and just, Watch us, stay tuned, um, and, and, and know that uh, I, I think as the publication grows, we're, we truly hope that we're uh, continuing to add to the larger growth of, of our community. Yeah, we are flexing our digital muscles because even now, many times when we begin to talk about a story, and how we're going to tell that story. We start off talking about putting it on paper. And before you know it, we've gone to a Facebook Live or a subject for the chicken box or something like that. So we are, we are um, having growing pains in our movement into um, the digital world, but, but we're doing it. And I think that the beauty of our jobs, you know, and, and just as creative people, naturally creative people, um, because I know Ms. Draper can have an idea a minute and even less sometimes, <laughs> I have to keep up. But um, I think just like what Misha was saying, you know, the future of Afro is exactly what we make it. You know, we are working very diligently and very hard to make sure that, you know, we have um, adequate coverage and, you know, despite of what's going on um, in our newsroom, you know, we always want to put the community first. And that's something that, you know, has gotten us this far, you know, and is going to take us even further. Um, but just like Misha was saying, you know, we're really ramping up our social media coverage, which is a task in and of itself. We've got Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and now we're on Clubhouse and <laughs> we have all these shows and, you know, we're just trying to do it all. And it definitely can be done. Um, um, but, you know, that's, it's, it's whatever we, we make it, you know, I, I, um, I had an idea uh, um, back in 2019 when I started um, about, you know, doing something about breast cancer. My mom is a 13-year breast cancer survivor, and it was a very long, and ugh, it was a terrible experience, really. Um, but she survived, and so I really wanted to do something to honor her and, you know, spread awareness and honor all the other survivors. So, you know, I said, well, you know, Rev, <laughs> can I do this? Can I do, um, you know, a, survive, a survivor's survival guide? I wanted to do like this special section in the paper and Rev's like, okay, go ahead. And so I did it and, you know, we got an overwhelming response and, you know, I did it last year as well. And the response was the same, very overwhelming. Like people, our readers um, and viewers um, of our shows, they, you know, 
they, you know, they just hopped right on it and they sent in all their stuff. They sent in pictures and very long, you know, um, um, pieces about their experience and their advice to others who are still in the fight and others who, you know, are, are survivors and things like that. You know, it's, it's beautiful. So, I mean, it's, it's, we can do, we can do it all. We can do it all. Well, let, let me weigh in on some of our specific goals. You're muted. We want to take our, you know, and I have a special cup for that too. You, um, we have an Afro mall and you see my cup? So somebody, <laughs> so, so that's, um, we want to, we have some specific goals. We want to take our 665,000 Facebook followers to a million. Um, we want to take, and so we ask that you like, follow us since you asked where we're going. Uh, we just hit 10K on Instagram, but we want to double that. We didn't realize, uh, maybe we should have, that only 9.7% of all the companies in the world get to at least 10,000. So that opens up a lot of doors for us. Um, Jessica, I don't know if you saw, you got, I think, 11,000 on Twitter now. So really want to push our social media. That's one thing we want to do. The other thing that we're doing differently, and you ask us where we're going in the future, this year, for the first time ever, each month, we are devoting an entire edition to a one subject, one whole edition. And so we did community activists in January. Uh, we did African American first in February. Y'all help me out with in March is what, what are you all working on in March? Surviving the pandemic. Surviving the pandemic in March. So there's a health focus there, creating black wealth in April. And we've always done special sections, but we've never taken an entire edition and just focus on that. And so the local breaking news will be on afro.com. But that edition will have a specific subject matter. The other thing that we really are pushing, and um, you know, this is like this is a shameless plug, but you, somebody asked, so I'm going to put it out there. We want to invite you to become members. We're we're moving from subscribers to members, and it's really affordable. I go to Afro.com. You can do that. Someone said, I think it was Misha said, we're not we're not on the street. We may never be on the street in the traditional way. If you are a member, you can either get your legacy edition. Some people just love that, Lisa. Some people love the legacy edition. You can get that print edition or you can get the print and the digital edition. So we are really moving in that way. We want to make the Afro accessible. And we also want to find a way to make our archives more accessible. We have a million photographs that are not yet digitized. We have a whole lot of digitization to do. We have some that are digitized. And so um, those who are viewing this broadcast, I don't know if you know this, you may, you can go to the Enoch Pratt Free Library now. If you have a library card, you can access the Afro archives from 1893 through 1988 just by having a library card. So we wanna make our uh, archives more accessible. And some of you may also know that we were awarded last year this time, the right to develop the Upton Mansion in Old West Baltimore. And so one of our goals is to return to our roots in Old West Baltimore and to be able to put all of our archival collection in one space, have it available for the public. Um, because people call us all the time and say, do you still have that picture when my mother did whatever in 1960 something? And I can say to them now, go to any prep free library, put in your library card number, or if you don't have one, get one, they're free and you can research it for yourself. So those are some of the things we, we are doing. We're going to redevelop that mansion. It's going to be beautiful. Alisa uh, is going to be an anchor in Upton. I know you're in Drew, you, your family was in Drude Heights, but that was the community right, right next to that. And so we're going to do that. So we have some other things that we want to do. We want to do some television. We want to do a documentary. Uh, uh, who was that? Jessica said, I, we can have an idea a minute, but let me tell you this. Ideas that we have are not developed in a vacuum. These ladies and the rest of the Afro team and our readers are very much a part of what our next is. Thank you. Um, just one last question. Part of it's from the audience. Part of it is from a question we already had prepared. Um, so the question is, how do we encourage young people to get, engage and promote their communities? And I will say that I will kind of put myself on the spot here and answer this question as being a member of Gen Z. Uh, early on Gen Z, um, I will say education is key. Um, 
I was only able to learn about the Afro-American newspaper through my college courses, African-American studies at University of Maryland College Park. Uh, but I should not have to wait until I get to college to learn this history. It should be introduced in elementary, middle and high school as well. That is one of the number one ways to get students uh, not only involved in their history, uh, but wanting to be a part of that history. For Lily Carol Jackson right now, we are working on an IMLS grant project where we are cultivating a civil rights curriculum for Baltimore City Schools, where we are creating a curriculum for these teachers all about Baltimore civil rights history, which will of course include the history of the Afro-American newspaper and uh, John Murphy Sr. is actually on the cover of our first unit. Um, and that will be introduced into schools. And not, not only will students of all cultural backgrounds know the civil rights history of Baltimore, but specifically black students, seeing yourself in your history and not just negative history, but positive empowering stories really does a number on your self-confidence and really encourages you to do better. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. But the second part is, uh, do you guys have advice uh, for aspiring journalists? I'm going to hop in on, on the first part, mm -hmm. but I am, I am apologizing in advance. I'm in Chicago right now. My mom just moved and I'm helping her move. So my dogs are lapping. She's cooking in the background. <laughs> um, but that said, I, I, the first part of the question, which was how do we get younger people to engage? Uh, one way is about putting, is by putting them in the paper. Young people are amazing and doing such great things. And we had the opportunity to feature them in our community activist edition, which was the first iteration of We're Still Here for 2021, uh, January 2021. And uh, we featured uh, about, I think, 25 young, people, young activists under the age of 35. And because we did that, that one, I got a huge wake up call that we're not, we get an opportunity to cover young people a lot, but we're, we are only scratching the surface in terms of the amount of young African-American people who are making a difference. But it also, they get to see themselves in the paper, they get to see themselves online, and then they're making sure that all their friends and family know about the Afro. And uh, with our social media campaign it's, that was attached to that, it heightened our social media numbers in a major way. We were doing it because, hi because highlighting community activists, particularly young people, is an important thing. But the, the domino effect of how it has helped the Afro and I think helped the next generation of Afro consumers, um, we didn't, you know, I didn't necessarily think about it. Some, maybe some of our visionary leaders had already <laughs> done so. Um, but I think, you know, engaging young people can ensure that they will continue to support the Afro, continue consuming the Afro by reading and watching our, um, our coverage uh, is, is the way to go. And of, of course, I agree with my fellow Terp Alexis that education is key. Uh, since I'm talking, I'll go ahead and answer what my advice for young journalists are. And that's just do it. Get out there and start looking, evaluating what kind of stories even interest you, what kind of stories aren't being told, and start writing. And start writing could just, you know, be posting it as a, as a Facebook post or, or you're on Instagram. I mean, one thing that I that almost grinds my gears, but also super excites me is that everyone really has the ability to be a journalist these days, right? With the ability to have this cell phone and they can capture it and get quotes. Um, and so just do it. Uh, I ran away from my love of journalism for a number of years. I majored in theater in college. My, and my parents the whole time thought I should be a journalist, told me I should major in journalism. Start, worked as a professional actress, taught acting, all of that before I went back to grad school for journalism. Uh, and this is a big thing with the University of Maryland, so I'm stealing it from them, but their big thing is fearless, fearless whatever. And fearless journalism is what I think has helped me understand how to be a good journalist by really jumping in and saying, hey, these, these are stories that have to be told. I can't be afraid to tell it. Um, and yeah, that, that's my advice. And get training, read, read, read all the time. Um, you know, a, a training could just be, a, a, be courses, but 
again, while I already said that everyone has the ability to be a journalist with this thing, it grinds my gears when it's not right, <laughs> when, when, when the grammar is not there, um, you know, when, when just certain things could have been uh, highly elevated journalism and content had, had a person, you know, just stepped in a few courses. And for those who are currently working as journalists, um, my advice is to keep continuing to educate yourself. Um, I really thank the Afro because they give us the opportunity to do workshops and to continue to grow. Media is ever changing. And so the fact of the, you know, I graduated only five years ago from grad school, but so much has changed in five years. And so we all have to be constant uh, learners in, in this world if you want to be a good journalist. And I'll also say, um, to really piggyback, I feel like I've been piggybacking all night, but yeah, to piggyback once again from Misha, um, you know, you really have to immerse yourself in this world, you know, and, and use your phone, use social media, use TikTok, use Snapchat. I know that's not really, uh, but you know, whatever it reels, Instagram, use it you know, to, to be a reporter. If you really want to be a reporter, then go out there and do it. Because, you know, not only are you getting your stuff out there, you know, are you, you're getting your feet wet, but you can also take these things, package that, and then send it off to a news station or, you know, a radio station or a television station. I mean, you know, whatever. So it's like, you really just have to get, it, you make that your world, you know, and um, don't be, I would say, don't be afraid to try other things too, because I just knew that I was going to be a, an anchor on TV. I was like, I'm going to be this, I'm going to do it. But then, you know, I, I really threw myself into the work and I'm like, you know, I really like this writing thing. And then it kind of morphed from that the writing thing to, you know, being an editor. I'm like, I like writing, but I also like editing people's writing, you know, and I'm kind of good at this. So, you know, don't be afraid to move around a bit, you know, and don't be so locked in. Like, I have to be a reporter that, you know, you, you, you kind of don't get any other experience. So that's what I, I would say. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming out and, well, not, I guess not coming out. We're in our, all in our homes. Uh, but for logging on and viewing this program. Thank you to all of our panelists for agreeing to do this. It was amazing speaking to all of you guys. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. Um, for everyone watching, please go to afro.com, uh, subscribe, become a member, read their articles, support them. As you can see, everyone there is brilliant. Um, also, go ahead, feel free to visit the BMI.org, see other upcoming events for our museum, and also visit the Lily Carol Jackson Museum.org as well. And if you want to book yourself a virtual tour, I'm leading those. So, you know, you can see more of me if you like. But thank you again, everyone, for participating in this. And everyone, I wish you a great night. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you having us. Much. Stay Thank safe, you. everyone. God bless. Thank you.